Well, good morning. Good morning, friends. How are you this morning? Good. Some of us are, what, old friends. We've been friends for a while. Some of us are new friends, and some of you guys are going to meet me right now. My name is Teresa Renkevich, and I'm the children's pastor here at our community, Cape Coral Community Church. Now, I'm not lost, although you might think that that's what it appears to be. I understand I'm not in kids' church, um, and I, I, I'm in the beloved big church, as we call it in kids' church. We call this the big church. So David, our uh, lead pastor, he lets me come up here once in a while and, and speak to you guys. And I, I think it's because he, he remains in awe of how many stories I have about messing up and going the wrong way and making the wrong turns and getting flipped upside down and inside out and backwards and forwards and and yet still <laughs> I get back up the next day and do it all over again and and you know I do that I, I continue to do this thing we call life in this vehicle we call faith and although I chose the, the right vehicle I know I chose the right vehicle. I still have to make sure I take some safety measures. You know, I got to get buckled in when I get in. And I've got to put that fireproof gear on when I get in. And I've got to make sure that headset's working and I can hear clearly. I still have to do those things because although I might have picked the right vehicle, I don't know that the road got any better. I mean, I might say it may be a fact that Maybe those turns got just a little bit harder. Or those bumps kind of shake you up a little bit more. Those hills got just a little bit steeper. Man, you know, I, I'm, I might say that that's what happened once I got into these fancy new wheels I call faith. See, you guys know what she looks like, that car of faith. When you first lay eyes on her, she's beautiful. Isn't she? I mean... You don't have to be some car enthusiast to have that dream car in your head. Don't even, you don't even have to like cars a lot. We all have one, don't we? We all have that vehicle that we just oh, makes you sweat thinking about it, doesn't it? Just that one that you would love to have. You know, I mean, for some of us, it's like a brand new car, spanking new right off of the, the dealer lot. For some of us, it's the old classic cars. I know I got some old classic car guys over here. Some of us want some big cars, maybe even huge cars like monster trucks, right? So we could just run over everything in our way. Or maybe, maybe it has two wheels and you can feel the wind in your hair and we call that a Harley. Or maybe it has 18 wheels and we call it a Pete, huh? But we all have that vehicle in our head, whether we love cars or not, we have that. We, there's something that, that this package just makes our heart go pitter patter. And see, that's how faith kind of comes packaged to us. It's like that brand new car. And it's not just the packaging, but it's what's in the packaging. It's what that packaging promises you when you first lay eyes on her. It's what's in there. It promises of a better life, easier roads, the wind in our hair, that new car smell. Oh, love that car smell. I mean, and that's what we're looking for when we first walk into faith. That is what we're looking for. We're looking for those promises, aren't we? We're looking for that something different. We're looking for the promise of tomorrow, something great to look forward to, the better roads. That's what we're looking for. And I'll tell you what, that owner's manual in that faith vehicle that's tucked away deep into the glove box, it has lots of those promises in it, doesn't it? It has lots of those promises. It delivers. It delivers like no other. You know, we have this vehicle now that can take us to this beautiful eternity. This beautiful eternity. You know, I don't know if you guys, and if we got your own your owner manuals. That's what we call our Bibles here is our owner manual because that's what it is. It's for us. But, you know, if you go to the book of Revelation, John actually gets to see images of heaven, and that's what Revelation is all about, is, is a revelation he has, and he actually sees images of heaven. Now, there's other images throughout the Bible, and there's other accounts of heaven, but I just picked this one in particular. So if you guys would pull out your, your uh, Bibles, and if you don't have your Bibles, you can pull out your phones if you have a Bible app, and if you don't have that, I even put it in the bulletin for you. <laughs> I got to get a little kid's church on you guys. When I, I have the kids bring their Bibles to class, and when they don't bring them, or when I say, who's got their Bible, and I got one or two that raise their hand, they know what's coming. They're like, uh-oh, here goes Miss Teresa again. 
She's going to do it again. And what do I do? I say things to them like, do you guys go roller skating without roller skates? And they all go, no. And I say, do you guys play baseball without a bat and a mitt? And they all go, no. And I'll put it in terms you guys can understand. Do you guys go wash windows without Windex? No, right? What about you car enthusiasts? Do you go fix the car without, car, with, uh, without tools with you? No. So then they know what's coming next. Miss Teresa's going to have it on them. They know. <laughs> so how do we learn about God if we don't bring his word with them? So, so that's just how I razz my kids a little bit. So sorry about that. It's hard to pull the kids' church out of the kids' pastor. It's, it's a hard thing to do. So anyway, back to John. I'm sorry, I digress. John, in the book of Revelation, and I kind of zoned in on, on Revelation 21, and I just put down some verses, but let's just kind of take a look at those. We're not, I'm not going to read them word for word, but I just kind of want you to glance over them. And if, if you take a look at that first one at the top, on um, Revelation 21.4, um, you know, he, he starts talking about things like no tears, no death, no sorrow, no pain. Yeah, I'm totally up for that. Like, that, that sounds good to me. Hey, hey, yeah, hallelujah, let's go. Let's try this out. But if you keep going down and you look through some more of these, these descriptions he made of what he saw, you know, he starts to describe the roads and the walls and this, this water, this beautiful stream. And he uses precious gemstones a lot. He talks about precious gemstones. The walls are decorated in them. Now, think about how visually sensational it would have to be to see just walls decorated and precious gemstones. And so many of them. I mean, I'm reading through here, and actually, that's why I didn't want to read the verse, because I don't even know how to pronounce some of these gemstones. I've never even heard of them. But so many gemstones. Just imagine what John's eyes must have been going through when he saw these visions. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful promise, isn't it? It's exciting. And then not only the beauty, but... There's a lack of that negative emotion he talks about, and not only the lack of negative emotion, but a surplus of love and joy and peace and comfort. Imagine that world. I mean, that makes me excited. I bet John was just jumping out of his pants when he woke up that day. Like, I, I, that makes me excited. I want to see that one day. I want to see that. But see, what happens after we get into these shiny new wheels we call faith and we get that big, excited thing, and we're, we're ready for this destination called heaven. You know, we start looking around as we're driving, and maybe those roads didn't get quite as much better as you thought they would, right? You know, or, or maybe that, that new life, that better life, didn't magically appear quite like you thought it would after you, you got behind the wheel. It just doesn't all kind of flush out exactly like you thought. And you know, that wonderful eternity, it's a great promise, but it's, it's easy to lose sight of it sometimes. It really is, because if we have the opportunity to drive up close to it, and some of you may be able to ha share that experience, if you have the opportunity to drive up close to it, it becomes very clear. But the problem is, is for most of us, there's a really big gap between living today and tomorrow and the next day and the next day and that eternity. There's a big gap in there for us. But what we forgot is when we got into this vehicle, when you got into that vehicle, when you stepped in and you took on that faith and that was going to be your way through this road, when you did that, it came equipped with GPS. Yeah, even the classic cars came equipped with GPS. And it's not just GPS. It's a GPS that is specifically routed just for you. Has a specific route laid out. You're not going to get lost on this route. You're not going to lose your way. You're not going to crash on this route. And you know what? It even can tell you where to make the legal U-turn, even better than our GPS. It'll tell you where. That's what's in that vehicle of faith for you. So all you have to do is listen to those little instructions. Make the next safe right. <laughs> all right, so... Here comes the confession part of my sermon. Those of you who know me know that I like to confess during my sermons for some reason. And I don't know if it's these bright lights pointing down on me or the fact that I was raised Catholic, so I got really used to confession. But I, I like to confess, so here it goes. 
I'm going to say hello. My name is Teresa. Can you guys do a hello, Teresa? Thank you. I am undoubtedly, uncurably, hopelessly a stressaholic. Yeah, you guys think it's funny, but it's true. I live for stress. I live for stress. As a matter of fact, when my life gets too peaceful, just ask David. I go find stress. <laughs> I go create it in my head if I have nowhere else. I am a stressaholic. I love it. I mean, it's usually in my own mind, and I'll do things like I bite off more than I can chew, more than I can handle for the day. And I know, I know there's some of you guys out here just like me. Don't tell me there's not. Like, you can't just go to work and do your job. You got to do it better every day. You got to take those extra hours, those extra projects, and put it all in, don't you? Or maybe you're a super mom. I love super moms. I tried being one of those for a long time. <laughs> You want your kids to have every opportunity that you missed out on, right? You want them to have them all. They, they can't miss them. And you want to keep them busy in good stuff so they don't get messed up in that bad stuff, right? So if you keep them doing good things, then they're good. So, so you do things like get up at, like, I don't know, some very dark hour in the morning because you're going to take them into school before school so they can do that, that weightlifting or that early football practice or that club meeting, whatever it is. So you take them in really early. And then they go to school all day, and you rush off to work. And then once 5 o'clock hits, you plow through those doors like an Olympic racer. Out the door you go. Why? Because you've got to get all the way across town. You've got to get all the way across town and pick those kids up from school. And then you've got to get over to karate. And after karate, you've got to get over to that second football practice. And then after that second football practice, you've got to get over to piano lessons. They love the piano lessons, right? And then maybe there's something else after that. But finally, you get home, and you've got to do homework. Oh, there's so much homework. There's always so much homework, 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 right? Or maybe you're just the provider. You work 16 hours today, but you know that lawn needs to be cut. The oil in the car needs to be changed, and your wife really shouldn't be using that leaky faucet anymore. That isn't right that she has to use that, right? So you got to get that fixed. And maybe if you get really lucky tonight, you might, you might get five minutes of TV in before you fall out on the couch, right? You know me, don't you? <laughs> you all know me. I make my life busy. I love when my life's busy. I mean, I might complain about it, but quite honestly, these little stressed out marathons that I go on, they make me feel good. It's a high, literally. Literally, stress hormones running through your body give you a natural high. You have supernatural powers. You have things going, going on in your brain quicker than you can. And maybe some of the little things fall off, right? Maybe some of the unimportant stuff falls off. You lose some of that. But, boy, that blood's pumping sometimes. Those neutrons are kicking in your head, and you just feel alive, don't you? It's addictive. I'm a stress junkie. Do I have any fellow? Anybody who would admit to being a fellow stress junkie this morning? <laughs> Nobody wants to. Okay, I got a few brave ones. I know there's more of you. I know there are. So why am I making this confession to you this morning? Well, that's because this is what happens to me when I'm driving that faith car. See, once my new expectations started to fade about this great faith that I had, taked on, I had taken on, and <clears throat> I started thinking, well, maybe there's something wrong with this car, right? Because things didn't quite go so right. Not like I thought they would. I mean, maybe I took the wrong route. or I don't know, maybe I shouldn't really be listening to that GPS. Maybe it really doesn't know where it's going. I mean, this isn't what I expected. But then I realized, you know, there's nothing wrong with this faith car or the destination or even the road there. I mean, the only problem there is, is there's something going on between my two ears that's malfunctioning the whole system. That's what that stress is doing. I'm malfunctioning it, and the only place it's happening is right in between here. It's not the car. It's not the road. It's not the GPS. And you know, <clears throat> if you can get through life, this life, I, and not be stressed out, then we need to get together and talk after service because what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it on YouTube and I'm going to make millions of dollars because honestly, I have a four-year-old little girl that will yell at me, I'm so stressed. She's four. <laughs> She's four. 
So if you can manage to make it to 20 and never say those words once in this world, I mean, you're a mutant in our world, are you not? I mean, you don't even belong here. So I mean, I know, we all know what it is. We don't escape it. But the thing is, is that <clears throat> well, I wanted to do something for you today. I wanted, I wanted you to walk out these doors with a plan. You know what I hate so much is the other day I actually, I watched sermons from a lot of different um, pastors, and I won't even say who, but it was a long sermon. It was like 85 minutes. <laughs> I'm not going to talk to you for 85 minutes this morning, but it was a long sermon. But the reason I, I listened to it is because an email came through, and it had the perfect question, something I, uh, something had, I had going on in my life. And the, the headline was the question that I wanted the answer to. So I got really interested. So I watched this 85 minutes. I mean, some points I was like, come on, get back up. I watched this whole 85 minutes, and I got to the end, and I realized that I still didn't answer the question. Like, I didn't, I don't know, I heard a lot of stuff. It was pretty good. It was mostly interesting. But, like, I didn't have an answer to the question. I want you guys to have an answer to that question today. I want us to plan to wage war on stress today. That's what I want to do. I want us to do that. I think that is my duty. I think that's my duty to you is to give you some of these steps. I mean, God walked me down these paths to stress over and over and over and over again. I mean, quite a few times. He walked me down these paths. He showed me different ways. He sent me this information. He gave me some ideas on how to deal with it. I owe you a plan. So that's what I want to do today is give you that plan. So I want to give you that plan and some easy to follow steps. How about that? I'm simple. I do kids church. You know what? Step one, do this. Step two, do this. I like that, right? That's what, that's what I do. So I want you guys to have some simple steps to walk out of here with today. So we have to start with a level playing field, okay? We have to start with agreeing on a few things. Can you guys agree on a few things before we move on? The first thing we have to agree that we are going to do is we are going to stop blaming the car. It's not the car's fault, okay? We're not going to blame the car. We are not going to blame the road. It's not the road's fault. It's not the circumstance, okay? It's the stuff that goes on between our ears. It's not your job, it's not your debt, it's not your family, it's not your wife, it's not, your, it's not any of that. It isn't any of that, okay? Here's the thing. We like to think that we have no control over stress, that stress happens to us. But we have control. I have control of stress. Say it. I have control of stress. You have control. You do. I don't care what the liar wants to tell you that you don't. You do. It is not the circumstance. You have total control over it. So now that we know that we have control, we can impact our response to stress. It's all it is. It's the response. It's not going to go away. We have control. All right, so let's dig into this program. <clears throat> See, Paul had some stuff going on in between his ears, too. And Paul actually ran around meeting a bunch of people that had stuff going on in between their ears. Now, back in these days, in biblical times, I'm not quite sure that, like, stress was the buzzword or the real popular word that everybody used like we do today. But if you read about it, that's what they were experiencing. The same exact thing we experienced just in their times with their problems and their stuff. So it just wasn't the buzzword back then. Now it is. But especially the Philippians. It's funny because, remember, that was the happiest book of the Bible, right? Philippians is the happiest book of the Bible. But, boy, those people had some stuff going on. They had some stuff that Paul needed to address with them. So he talks to them about stress. So pull out either your owner's manual or your iPhone or your bulletin or whatever, however you want to look at this scripture. And let's take a look at what Paul had to say to them, okay? It is in Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. He says, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry, he might have meant to say stress here, I don't know, about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand. 
His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. All right, well, we got it. I guess we can go home now, right? <laughs> Those are instructions, good instructions at that, but I don't know if we've quite hit that easy-to-follow step part, right, that I promised you. So let's dig in just a little bit more, all right? And I want to go verse by verse, okay? We have a few verses in here, so I want to go verse by verse. Verse 4, the first thing he starts off by saying is, Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Oh, easy peasy, right? No, it's hard to be full of joy all the time. It's so hard. Like, I remember we had a really bad December one year, and, and Sherry came in, and she, she deemed January joyful January, right? So we had to be joyful in January. So if we had anything negative to say or anything negative we did, we had to cancel it out with good. Like, we always had to define the bright side of everything. She drove us nuts. And I'll tell you what, it was probably like, I think about January 4th that we really started breaking the rules. And that was really only because of the way the holiday fell. We were actually off work January 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. So we lasted like a whole day, <laughs> a whole day of trying to be joyful. I mean, for real, it, it was hard. It, it was very hard. You, I think she got tired of reminding us at one point. But let me tell you how I navigated this, this verse in relation to stress, all right? About a week ago, my sister posted something on Facebook. And it was actually somebody else's words that she had read in a tweet, and she kind of modified it a little bit and, and reposted it. It was, it was her way of being optimistic and encouraging to her friends and family on Facebook. You know, one of those nice, feel-good, warm posts, right? But part of it said something that really kind of took me back. She said, it said um, things like, do you know that the strongest people are usually the most sensitive? The most kind people are the first to get mistreated. The people who take care of others most are the ones that need to be taken care of most. You know, and this got me thinking. Like, I started thinking back to, like, my childhood days, and I'd come home from school, and I'd say to my mom, oh, mom, the kids, they were so mean to me at school today. And my mom would say things to me like, oh, the meanest kids need the most love, Teresa. you got to remember that. The meaner they are, the more love they need. And, you know, and I even pass that information on to my kids now. I say it, too. At the time, I was like, okay, Mom, whatever, but <laughs> they're still very mean. <laughs> but, I mean, I'm passing that on now, but really, stop and think about this. Stop and think about this. We reveal our weaknesses without even knowing we're doing it. I mean, we do. I mean, think about, <clears throat> think about people who stress about doing everything perfect. Why? Because they're afraid of being faulted, Right? Or, or what about those of us that respond to things in angry outbursts? Why do we do that? Why do we respond that way? Maybe because we're deeply hurt. You know, we respond these ways to these things because every single human action has a motivation. Every single action we take has a motivation. And if we're operating from places like fear, and hiding, and anger, if we're operating from places like that, joy becomes impossible. Joy becomes absolutely impossible. So step one of our four-step process is identify your stress. I want you to spend a week on this. I'm actually going to give you four of them, and I want you to spend a week on every single one. And a week's just a starting point. It's going to take more than a month, but a month is a really good kickstart on this. So I, I want to challenge you to go in order of these steps that I give you today. I want to challenge you, and for the next four weeks, to do these steps. And then in 30 days, I want you to come back to me. I want you to come back and talk to me personally. I want you to email me. I want you to call the church. I want you to flag me down in the grocery store, and I want you to tell me how your stress has changed in 30 days. That's what I want you to do. Come find me. Tell me. I want to see if this works. Test me. All right, so step one or week one, we're going to identify our stress. Just like we can easily identify the bully's stress, right? We know what the bully's problem is. We know the caretaker's stress, right? They need to be taken care of. Who are you? Who are you? Are you the one that's always in control because you're afraid of being out of control? Are you the one that's always pleasing everybody because you don't want to let down anybody? Who are you? What is keeping you from being full of joy in the Lord? Why can't you rejoice? 
<clears throat> because something's going on in between your ears, right? It's malfunctioning the whole system. So spend a week on it. Figure out what it is. It's not your life, like I said before. It's not your circumstance, not your kids, not your job, not your pay, not your debt. It's none of those things. It's between your ears. Stop robbing yourself of that joy. Paul's telling you, be full of joy. These words came from God himself down to Paul to a bunch of Philippians that were stressed out. Let's listen to them. All right, so let's keep moving. We're going to go to the next verse. Verse 5 says, Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. All right, so he's very clearly telling us the end's in sight, right? We know that, no problem. We got that. Remember that, that promise when we first laid eyes on her so pretty? Remember that, the new car smell? Yep, we got all that. But we figured out already that it gets a little foggy as we drive, right? It gets hard to see. So <clears throat> he actually has a sentence right before that that tells you how to do it. He says, be considerate in all you do. Another word that's used in other translations of considerate is mindful. Be mindful in all you do. All right. I'm sorry. I'm really going to get a little kids' church on you just one more time. <laughs> I promise this will be it for the day. No more, no more kids' church, okay? Because I actually brought some Legos. My son loves Legos. He would be so excited if he were in here. Is he in here? Oh, he is. There. See, Tyler loves it. <laughs> you excited mom brought Legos today? See, and I'm going to put this little structure together here that I got. And this is what I'm going to tell you. One day or another, somehow, some way, either this church or another church or somewhere else, you walk through the doors of a church and you look like that. Did you know that? You look just like that. Might have been a decade ago, might have been a week ago, might have been today. You came in looking like that. See, this bottom Lego is where you started. And what happens with Legos is, is they have connections, right? So you started off down here, but you needed to make connections. You've got to make connections in your life. You've got to be connected to things, right? You've got to make connections at work. You have to make connections with people. You have to make connections with the events that they do at work, right? Because that's how we're designed, is to make connections. So you make some work connections, and you make some family connections, and you make some other connections. And then what happens is you walk through our doors. And here you are, all connected up. And you walk through our doors, and here's the thing is that... <clears throat> You have to make connections here. In any environment you want to be successful, you have to make connections here too, right? So you want to be successful in this faith thing. So what happens is, is you start making connections. You come to church on Sunday. Maybe you join a little community group. Maybe you, you, know, you start doing some stuff and you make connections. And you start adding to this structure that you started with and you make connections and see what eventually happens is that your structure starts tipping over. See, what you really needed to do when you walk through these doors was to take the structure back down and start with faith. And then you needed to start building connections based on faith. Because rather than trying to fit faith into the mess that we've already created, we need to start over at the bottom <coughs> and start connecting things the right way. Because when you base it on faith, things go together well. Things fit well. Connections fit well. You know, we can never figure out these, like we have community groups that we have people in, and, and as a staff, we wanted to get you guys involved, and we talk about it, like how do we get people involved? And I'm telling you what it is. We couldn't figure out why people were kind of resistant to it. It's because it's just another connection that's going to tip over your structure. That's, what, that's the way you're looking at it. Because you already have so much going on, like seriously, you want me to come another night a week? Really? That's what you're thinking. But see... The reason we're trying to get you to do that is because the purpose, the true operation of a community group is that you just live your life. You just live, live, you work. You do what you do. You raise your kids. You have your family problems. You do all that. But you do that in connection with other people who share the same views, who are walking the same path, who are trying to stay on the same road with you. That's how you do it. And you end up with a sturdy structure that way. You have a sturdy structure. Paul is saying, be mindful, be considerate, be intentional in all you do. Build your structure the right way. 
All right, I got to keep moving. I'm going to keep you guys too long this morning. I'm sorry, but let me move on to the next verse, verse 6. He says, Don't worry, I think he meant stress, just saying, about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for what he's done. Okay, I'm going to just simp- I'm, I'm going to state this really, really simply for Paul, okay? Adjust your attitude to gratitude. That's your next step. Adjust your attitude to gratitude. That's what he's saying. That's exactly what he's saying. Worry is negative prayer. Stress is negative prayer. Worry is an invitation for a t- an attack. Stress is an invitation for an attack. Adjust your attitude to gratitude. He did say, because what happens in these things is that you block your ability to have communication with God. You block your ability when you're there. And if you notice, Paul didn't say, when you're stressed or when you're worried, pray. He didn't say that. He didn't say when you were stressed or when you were worried. What he said is he said, don't stress, don't worry. Instead, 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 instead means to replace. Instead, pray about everything. He was telling you to replace it. And the only way I've ever found successful to do this was I actually, my sister had sent me a, 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 a gratitude journal, she called it. And I was in a really bad place, and she sent me this journal and with a little note telling me to write down things for five minutes in the morning that I was happy about and that I was grateful for. And I thought, well, this is silly. Like, what's this going to do? I really thought it was the silliest thing. So it sat on a shelf for a long time. And then I finally pulled it out. And what happened was, is I sat there with blank pages staring at me, and I couldn't come up with very much to be grateful for. Like, I'm, I'm glad we have clean air to breathe. <laughs> um, but I kept at it. And the next day I sat down, and you know, I had a couple lines. And the next day I sat down, and I had a few more lines. And the next day I sat down, I had a full page. And before you knew it, I was writing two pages in five minutes as soon as I woke up out of bed in the morning. And then after that, I didn't have to write it because I got to the end of the journal. I just thought it when I got up. And then after that, what happened is not only did I think it when I got up, I thought it all day. And now it just becomes a way of life. It started changing how I look at things, how I see things. That's how it got into my, my system. And this way may not work for you, but I'm just telling you that's what worked for me. So I just, I, and that's all I can do is I can share what works for me. But figure it out. Figure out how you're going to adjust your attitude to gratitude. And spend a week on it. At least a week to begin. Do the jump start. Probably a little more working on later, I'll tell you that. But do the jump start for a week. And then comes the final step. Ah, the easy part. Sit back. But it's not effortless. You got to keep that in mind. Verse 7. Paul says, then, then, meaning after steps one, two, and three, then, then, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Paul is telling you, if you do what I just said, you will experience God's peace. I like to refer to this as decompression because when I get all stressed out, I feel like a really big hot air balloon that's like way overloaded on the air and is ready to pop, right? Can you feel it? Like, look, I can even, like, you can feel it. You're just full of that air. And when I finally manage to reroute myself and get into God's presence again, it just decompresses. But the thing about decompressing is that we're not geared to do it. So there's an extra step with this this decompression. You have to do it. You have to allow yourself to be decompressed. Because we're geared against it. I mean, this world is is full of people that that are busy. They stay busy, right? We stay. As a matter of fact, if you're too relaxed in this world, it's almost a social stigma. (laughs) Like, look at him. He doesn't care about anything. Does he not? Why is he not worried about this? It's a social stigma to be relaxed. So we have to allow ourselves to decompress. And you know what? Paul tells you right in that verse. People aren't going to understand. You aren't even going to understand this piece. He's telling you. He's forewarning you what we already know. So again, I challenge you. Spend a week on it. Each of the four steps I gave you for the next month. Go in order. Do these steps each for a week. 
Do what I told you this morning, and then come back to me and talk to me personally on Facebook. Tweet me on Twitter. I don't know, do this Instagram thing or whatever they do. I don't know all this stuff very well. You can text me. You can call me at the church. You can handwrite me a letter if that's your style. Go ahead, do that. Find me. Let's do this for 30 days. And then in 30 days, on what's today, August 24th and September 24th, let's come back and rate it. How much should our stress change on a scale from 1 to 10? 1 being low, 10 being high, right? Let's do this, guys. Let's change this. You know what? Let's hashtag it, because I'm telling you what, every time you hashtag something, it's really, really important. Important. It's, if you have a hashtag on it, you know it's important. So let's hashtag it. You guys, let's do this. Let's change this. So now, before we leave this morning, I do have some, one last thing I want to share with you, and it makes me happy. Happy, happy, happy. Makes me happy. You know, one of the best remedies for stress is laughter. And I'm telling you what, you are hitting a home run if you can laugh at your stress. <laughs> that is a home run out of the park, isn't it? So um, as we take up our offering this morning, um, you guys got your bulletins, don't forget your like, snack cards and your envelopes. Oh, and the Samaritan envelope from earlier, that's in there. You can put that in there too. Um, so as we take up our offering, I want you to sit back and take a look at this, at this video and, and enjoy some stress and some laughter and some happy and and I will admit really quick that I might have lied. I might get just a little bit kids' church on you one more time before we go this morning. So enjoy.